good morning. Give that again. Glad to be here. Glad you are all here this morning, especially braving the weather report. I haven't heard of anything falling yet, but I keep seeing the screen. Nora, did you do that on purpose? Put the snowflakes up on the background. Just... <laughs> okay, so you just you were hoping. <laughs> Well, I guess the, the term we can use this morning is dreaming. That was the reading that we had with our Advent this morning, talking about dreams, talked about John the Baptist's dreams, talked about Paul's dreams for the spread of Christianity over the world. And so I guess I want to start it out with just what are our dreams? I think uh, as we grow up, as we are our children, as we are teenagers, we, we dream about our future. The dreams we're talking about aren't the ones that, you know, I, I had some pasta late last night and just tossed and turned and the weirdest things were going through my head as I slept. It's not those types of dreams. We're talking about the hopes, the, the desires we have for where we're going, what's going to happen in our future, what is it going to look like when we get to the next stage of our life, whatever that might look like. And I think as we grow... As we get a little bit older, our dreams may be focused on, uh, if I could only get onto that specific ball team, then I could get the scholarships and move on to the things that I need to do. Or perhaps if I could only get accepted into that school or get those scholarships or find the things that I need to do to get the education so I can then get that perfect job and have a successful career and retire early and enjoy the last parts of my years on earth and, and just be comfortable with my life. Or if I could only marry that right person, you know, I know that's the person over there because I've seen them, I know them, and, and God just put me together with that person because that will be the perfect marriage, we'll have the perfect kids, that will be the dream that I have. And we, we kind of have these dreams, and as we get older, I think our dreams shift and change. Our dreams become supportive of the dreams of our children or our grandchildren. We look to their success. We say, I've, I've lived my life. Some of my dreams may have come true and reached reality. Some of them have, have passed on. I can no longer have those dreams, so let me change those or find something else to dream about. Hopefully, we don't stop dreaming. That's, I think that could be the case for some people. But our dreams shift. We, we are dreaming now the dreams of our children and our, our grandchildren, hoping that they can have the successful future and, and blessings from God that hopefully we have also enjoyed. So this morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1. Going over Scripture, you're probably familiar with it. If you've, if you've grown up at all in church world, you're, you will have heard this story at Christmas time, most likely. It's the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. You're, you're probably familiar with it, but we're going to go through it because it's, it's talking about dreams. In this case, probably an unfulfilled dream up to this point in their life. We're going to start with uh, verse 5. So if you could turn in your Bibles, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 5 is where we're going to start reading. It says, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. So I think we can kind of tell what one of their dreams may have been. For a, a part of their life, I think they desired having children. It points out here they had none. They weren't able to. For whatever reason, we may say, well, now that we have medical science, we can probably guess at some of the reasons for that, but in this time, in this society, this culture, it would have been an embarrassment. It would have been shameful, especially for Elizabeth. They would have blamed her for this, not ever looking to Zechariah, but saying, Elizabeth, what is it in your past? Or maybe as a family, what sins are there lurking in your, your family that are keeping you from having children? Why hasn't God blessed you with a child? Yes, maybe it was your dream, maybe it was your desire, but there must be something there. And Luke points out, says both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all his commands and decrees blamelessly. So they were doing the right things. They appeared to be good followers of God in everything that we're doing. It also talks about their, their lineage. Where did they come from? And it talks about Zechariah belongs to the priestly division of Abijah. How many of you here know what that even means? Anybody? 
I had to look it up myself. Uh, Abijah isn't a name that we see very frequently. It's, it's mentioned in Second Chronicles chapter 24, or 1 Chronicles chapter 24 once, as far as I can tell. And it's when David split the priesthood into 24 different divisions. Abijah actually comes from um, the, the, his, one of his ancestors was Eleazar. Again, a name that you've probably heard at some point, but you go, I have no idea who that is. But it's a son of Aaron. So they both... Elizabeth, it says, was from the descendant of Aaron. Uh, Zechariah is as well. We go, why do we care? What is important about Aaron? You know, yeah, you know, great, great, great grandfather Aaron, but uh, who cares? He was the start of the priestly lineage. Aaron was Moses' brother, part of the exodus from Egypt. God declared Aaron and his, his descendants would be the priests working in the tabernacle at the time, the tent that moved around, the place of meeting where God would come and fellowship with the people or, or share his thoughts, his desires with Moses, who could then tell the people what to do. Aaron was serving in the tabernacle with his, his sons, um, and so that lineage continued, and so they both have this important lineage pointing back to the start of the priestly line. And so, of course, Zechariah is a priest. He's serving God, and most likely at this point, because we're generations upon generations upon generations later, I can only imagine how many priests could point back to Aaron and this, this family of priests, the, the, those who could say, I am, because of my lineage, a priest serving God in the temple, in the synagogue, wherever they were serving. Probably quite a few people, and that's part of why I think David split it up and into 24 groups to say, let's create a process, let's create a rotation. This part of the group will serve at this time, that part of the group will serve at another time, so everybody gets their fair share working in the temple. And so here we are many generations later, and there's this priestly family. They're doing the right things. They're honoring God with their lives. They're, they're obeying his laws and decrees. They're righteous in God's sight, but yet he has not blessed them with a child. And I think their dream, now that it says they are very old, Bible doesn't pick and choose words kind of carelessly, I think very old, indicates they are well beyond childbearing years, at least by human understanding. So if we go ahead and move to verse 8, it says, Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God. So it's his term, his, his group's term, his order's term to serve in the temple. So he has gone to Jerusalem, left Elizabeth at home. He's there serving, doing his priestly duties, whatever those things are. And he was, says, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go to the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So he was chosen out of his group, special honor, usually a once-in-a-lifetime thing, to go into the holy place, not the most holy place, but just outside of that there was a not quite as holy place, I guess they would call it. Not the Holy of Holies, but this is where the, the altar of incense would have been. And it's not something we are probably familiar with, but if we look back to the original design of the tabernacle as decreed by God, that was carried over into the temple, then rebuilt later when after the temple had been destroyed and it was rebuilt, there's out in the courtyard where the, the people would be, they would sacrifice their animals, uh, cows, sheep, birds, whatever it was they brought as an offering of atonement to say, I have sinned this past year. I have sinned recently before you, God. I'm offering this sacrifice to pay for my sins. Please, please sacrifice. Please kill this animal. Sprinkle the blood. Move, put the meat of the animal across the flames there. They had a big altar that was burning probably almost constantly to, to raise these the, the, the scent or the, the smoke of these animals up to God asking for forgiveness for their sins because they understood they couldn't come before God to, to ask for blessings from God if they were carrying sins with them. So they started with saying, let me pray for my forgiveness. Let me offer these sacrifices. But twice a day when they had these times of sacrifice, one of the priests, in this case Zechariah, was chosen to take coals from that fire, that altar outside where they're offering these sacrifices, and he would take it into the holy place, a place separated from the common people of the land, a place only priests would go, and it was a holy place dedicated, consecrated to God. In this, there was the, on the one side, there is a table of showbread, bread specially baked daily for the priest, or for God, to, to, as an offering to him, and only the priests were allowed to eat of this bread. 
On the other side, there's a, a lantern or a, a light, a golden lampstand that was always lit, showing God's presence, lighting the space before the Holy of Holies. And right in the center, just at the entrance to the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant, the judgment seat of God, where they considered God's throne to be as he resided among his people, was this incense, this altar of incense. And who had put the coals that he took from outside where they're sacrificing animals, put it onto this golden altar, sprinkle the incense on it, and then say a prayer for the people on their behalf. It says, uh, all the people were assembled outside praying. So they're lifting up their prayers to God. The priest is inside with this incense. The idea being this sweet-smelling aroma is coming from the burning incense, raising the prayers up to God. Very symbolic, this whole process was. And he recites a prayer. Then he returns outside, and he, he shares a blessing among the people. And then they go about their day. A very common thing that they did. It was, it was a, a ritual that they did twice a day. I can only imagine that at least in the intertestamental period, the time between the Old Testament and the New period, uh, the New Testament, it was, it was about 400 years, and they called those God's silent years. There were no prophets. There were no declarations from God during that time. All throughout the Old Testament, God is constantly speaking and moving and, and talking to his people through different ways and means. But then there's this time of silence, 400 years. But during this time, the priests were still doing their duties. They would twice a day do this, 365 days a year. And I'm sure it had kind of been taught to the priests as they were growing up, going to, to priestly college, taking course 101. They learned the right prayer to say. They learned the right blessings to say. They learned the right process just in case they got picked to do it. And so they come in. They do their thing. They come out. They say their blessing, and people move on. But in this case, something different happened. In verse 11, it says, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. So Zechariah had just gone in carrying the coals. Normally the room is empty. There's nobody else there. But it says an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. And you were to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to him the hearts of the parents, or he will turn the, the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. If you are planning to go in, I'm sure he had checked with some of the other priests, okay, what is it I do again? I want to make sure I get this right. I say these prayers. I do these things. This is where I take the coals and put them. The room's going to be empty and not expecting anybody in there because it's a holy place. He walks in, there's an angel standing to the right of this, this altar where he's supposed to put the coals. And it says he was startled, and I think that's probably an understatement. Then it says he was terrified. I think that's probably closer to what he was feeling. And I think it's important. It says this angel stood to the right of the, the altar of incense. And I don't think that was by accident. I don't think that just happens to be the side of the room the angel came into. I think it's representing his position with God. Where is God in this? He would be in the Holy of Holies. This altar of incense is representing the prayers being lifted to God, and to be the right side of that is showing God's favor on this angel, this angelic being who is there. And so I think Zechariah may have understood that. One, I think it was very obvious to him that this wasn't just a normal person. I think he understood this was an angel. He was terrified. It wasn't just a, hey, what are you doing here? It's a, oh my goodness, something big is happening and I am scared. He understood that it was a representative of God speaking on God's behalf. And what does the angel say? He said, your prayers, these dreams that you've had, are going to be answered. This is a wonderful thing. It's not just that you're having a son, but this is going to be a very special son. He is going to speak, and he's going to represent. He's going to, to minister with the strength and the power, the spirit of Elijah, one of the greatest prophets that Israel had ever seen. 
ending this period of silence of 400 years. Not only that, he is going to come. He's, the, he's going to lead the way for the Lord who is coming, the Messiah who is coming. He is going to be introducing. He's going to be preparing the way for the one who is coming, this weighted Messiah. Not only is he fulfilling John's dream of having a son, he's fulfilling the dreams of the people of Israel, or at least proclaiming these dreams are about to be fulfilled. They'd been under some sort of oppressive rule for numerous years. For most of the 400 that they had existed at this point, they'd been taken into captivity, taken back into captivity, released from captivity, conquered by somebody else. And at this point, the Romans are the, the ones who are ruling Israel, and they wanted their own independence. They looked back to the time of David and said, we used to be a great nation. We used to be blessed and have a great relationship with God. We used to be a power in the world and hopefully a representative of what it looks like to be a, a nation under God and God blessing his people and what this relationship should look like with the hopes that other nations would come to believe in God as well. And I think they desired that, at least from the political side or the, the respect side around the world, saying, why can't we have that? We want our independence. We want the Messiah to come and return us to this position of prominence where we used to be. And so, at least on the surface, when the angel says he will be declaring the way of the Lord, or he will be here, John will be here to be the, the foreteller of the one who's coming, it might look to him at least saying, Messiah is right behind John. John will be your son. He's going to talk about the one who's coming right after him. But what does it say Zechariah's response was? If we look in uh, verse 16, it says, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. And I always thought this was a, a good question. If we were to jump ahead a few verses, we see angel coming to Mary, basically telling her the same type of story. You're going to have a son. It's going to be the Messiah. You are blessed. And what is her response? How can this be? I've never been with a man. I, it's I understand the dynamics of how all this works, and it's just not possible. How can this be? And so Zechariah seems on the surface asking the same question. But what is, the what is the angel's response? The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. And I always thought it was unfair. Why is Zechariah being punished at this point? Why can't he speak when, you know, Mary seems to ask the same question a little bit later, and, and the angel says she is blessed, and, he, and the angel goes on to talk more about the blessing she's receiving. Zechariah said, you're not going to be able to speak until the baby's born because you didn't believe. You doubted. And I think there's probably more to the question than what the words really represent. I think there's an attitude or there's, there's a tone to it that we may not see if we just read the words straight from the text. I could see Zechariah saying, wait a minute. Having a son was a dream that I had back when I was young. And you don't have any idea, Gabriel, how much Elizabeth and I really wanted to have that son. And we prayed and we prayed and we, we wanted to fulfill this dream of ours to have a son, a representative to carry on the family line, to be a part of this, to, to end the shame that we've had as a family not having children. But we've reached an age that we can't. And that was his response. He said, you know, I'm old. My wife is pretty old, too. We just can't have children. Gabriel, how is this going to be happening? And I think it was more a, it's not going to happen. Are you here teasing me? Are you, are you just, you know, is this, is this a prank of some sort that God is, is calling us out on? What is going to happen? You know, why are you doing this to us? Because we know children are just not possible at this point in our lives. That was a dream, but we've moved on. That is a lost dream that is not going to come true. But Gabriel starts out. He doesn't just give an answer of, well, this is God's plan and it's going to happen. Don't worry about it. He identifies himself. He says, I am Gabriel. 
I stand at the right hand of God, or just as I stand in the presence of God. And I think that's important. Most of what we hear comes from revelation about what heaven is like, and a lot of times we hear this group is bowing down and praying, and this group is bowing down and worshiping, and this group is bowing down. But what does Gabriel say? He doesn't say, I worship and bow down before God. I stand before God. He's a special character, I think, in the holy throne room that has that relationship with God that he's able to stand in the presence of God. And he's here being sent directly by God to share this message. When that angel shows up, Zacharias should have been listening. He, he trembled in fear. I think he was terrified by that, and he understood the, the significance of this being that was in his presence. But then he doubted. He challenged. He said, it's not going to happen. I hear what you say, but just not going to happen. That dream is gone from my life. And then it finishes up, the last part of the, the section where it's talking about Zechariah and Elizabeth in chapter 20, or verse 22. It says, when he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple. For he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. And so he finished up what he had to do in the temple. He returned home, somehow communicated to his wife what was going to happen. This is what the angel said, and that's why I can't speak, because I didn't believe it. And it says she was in seclusion, but she praised God, saying, the Lord has done this for me. This is a blessing from God. Even in my old age, he has provided a way for me to have a son, and he's shown favor and taken away my disgrace. He goes, so this is all well and good. How does that apply to us? What does it really mean to us? It's a nice story, and yes, John the Baptist was an important player as we, we learn about Jesus later on and the, his announcement of Jesus coming. But what does it mean for us? Why do we care? What is the importance of this? And so I challenge you as you look at your dreams. We all have them, have had them. Some of them come true. Some of them have not. Some of them were in the middle of going, I'm, I'm working hard, I'm trying, I'm struggling for this dream. Others are saying, I've given up those dreams, I have new dreams, or I don't even know what my dreams are at this point. But I think what this is showing us is God still has a plan. God still can use us. God still has things planned for us, dreams for us that we may not even know of. Or maybe our dreams are in line with his. I think Zachariah's dream was, was there at one point, and he'd given up, and it just said, not going to happen. Even an angel couldn't convince him of that until after the fact, when he, had, he, he couldn't speak, and he realized this truly was something that God was going to do. Elizabeth, her response, it seems to be, was different, just praising God, saying, thank you for blessing me. Thank you for providing this, this fulfillment to my dream. This doesn't mean that all of our dreams will always be fulfilled by God. But I think it gives us time to pause and a time to think and say, are my dreams in line with God's dreams? Are my dreams for my life, whether it's my future, my children, my, my whomever it is I'm dreaming for, are those in line with what God wants? And if not, should I consider what God is calling me to do? Should I think about, should I be praying more for God's guidance in my life to say, here are the dreams I have for you. Here are my desires for you to be my servant. We call him Lord of our life, and what that means is we are subservient to him. His will should be our will. His desire should be our desire, and his dreams should become our dreams. So as we are getting ready to sing a song in a few minutes and, and, and leave this place, go out, hopefully make it home safely without the snow, or we head to Bible study, wherever it is we're going, I urge you this week to be thinking about your dreams. What do those dreams look like? What are those dreams? What dreams have you had in the past that you've given up on? Perhaps those should be revisited. What dreams is God putting into your, your head now? What dreams is he calling you towards to say, you can still serve me in this way, young, old, anywhere in your life. I think he still has a dream, a purpose, a desire for us to be serving him in some way. And are our dreams being 
followed up by our actions. One of the things that was read during Advent is the actions that we do fulfill the dreams of God. And so are we acting in such a way that our dreams are being fulfilled along with God's dreams?